Without further ado, Mr. Egan. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> get too much into it, but basically, uh, this is a structure that's down in Newport and, and nobody knows who built it. I've been uh, studying it for the last 30 years. Uh, you see underneath of these pillars is three and a half tons of stone that goes five feet down to bedrock. That's something you don't see. And then there are these drums on top of the pillars, and then there's eight symmetrical pillars. And then there are these three unusual windows. This is the west window right here. Uh, but the, to get a view of inside of the tower, uh, I'm shooting from the west window, but looking towards the fireplaces that's in it. And then this is the northeast window, and this is uh, the south window, we call it. Uh, and you'll notice above the fireplace, there's this, uh, there's this archway, but uh, it abruptly ends right here where this window is. There's something special going on there. These are the beam sockets for the first floor right here. So the level of the first floor is right here. And that puts this fireplace about a foot and a half above the level of the floor. This is a wall fireplace. It's very unusual. In colonial buildings, the hearth is always right on the ground. And, and it has two flues. One goes up this side, one goes up this side, and in the center are these beam sockets. Very unusual. Two flues and beam sockets from a wall fireplace. There are all these clues, and there are all various niches that work their way into the tower. Basically, this is the first floor, and this is the second floor, and this is a room that has three windows. Well, there's five theories about who built the tower. The Vikings in 1150, the Templars in 1398, which we'll hear some more about today, uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese in 1421, a guy by the name of wrote a whole book that the Chinese came in these giant ships around the coast of Africa and built this as a pagoda lighthouse and this, this, this rice in the morning. Well, uh, you know, I, I know they might have their own ideas about the theory, but the Portuguese people think it was built by Miguel Corto Real, who got uh, shipwrecked uh, in the Atlantic. And uh, his brother Gaspar came to find it. He never found it, but somehow this guy had enough tools and, and the wherewithal to build this beautiful um, uh, tower. Uh, uh, and then the main theory that most academics go by is that the first governor of Rhode Island, whose name was Benedict Arnold, but not the traitor of the same name, this was the great 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 grandfather of the traitor, in his will of 1677, he calls it my stone built windmill. Well, it's not really like any other windmills at the time. There were hundreds of them up and down the coast. And they were all tapered, they all ta were made out of wood, first off, not stone, and they all tapered to the top because they had a turret that had to face the blades continuously towards the wind. Well, the, uh, the Newport Tower has a 28-foot uh, uh, diameter on the top. That would be a 24-foot 20, uh, 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 diameter, excuse me. Uh, that would be such a huge turret, you'd have to have a team of oxen to move it around. And the last thing you put in a windmill is a fireplace because one little spark and, uh, and, and uh, all the gases inside are very explosive. Well, my work is based on the work of Professor William Penhow, who was an astronomer from the University of Rhode Island. And he studied the tower uh, for thousands of hours and, and, and found these astronomical alignments of the windows of the tower. Here he is with his astrolabe, lining it up. And uh, in the tower, as I mentioned, are three windows, the west. And you see that it's tapered. It has uh, uh, the sides of it are tapered in and out. And the south window are, 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 is tapered as well. And then the northeast window is not. It's just straight in on all sides. But that means the beam of light can shine through these windows this way and with this window this way. Well, but then now in, in, his, uh, uh, in this paper that he published in 1990 that he presented in, in front of the American Society for, uh, of Astronomers in Chicago, predicted that on December 25th, 1996, the full moon will rise above the eastern horizon and be visible through these two windows, from the, right from this park bench right here. So I said, well, let's just see if Pettenhall's right. So I went there on that night, and sure enough, the moon shines right through these two windows. You see, that's the second window in there. This is an event called Lunar Minor. It happens only once every 18.6 years. Uh, it has to do with the north, the, it's the southernmost, with the northernmost risings of the moon. The following year, it's much higher, and for 9.3 years, works way back again. And it happened again on January 5th of this year. I took another photograph of that. And now it also said that you stand on this corner of the park, look through the west window and out the south window on the equino on, on the uh, December uh, winter solstice, uh, you will see the sun shine through these two windows. And sure enough, it happens like clockwork. The sun rises and boom, it shines right through these two windows. Here it was last year. Here it was a couple of years ago. So the professor was given a lecture one day, and he said that the interior room of the tower probably acted like a camera obscura solar disk calendar room. Whoa! What's that? Well, let's take it one at a time. Cameron Scura means dark room in Latin. In a dark room with one small hole, the image of what's outside appears on the inside. Solar disk refers to the sun, and how it works as a calendar. So let's look at the camera Scura. 
Here's a scene of uh, outside, and all the light rays crisscross as they come through the hole, and then you see uh, inside an image projected on the wall upside down. This is basically how a camera works, only a camera uses a lens to sharpen the image at a certain distance. But with just a hole, what they call pinhole photography, you'll see the image on the, on the, on the interior wall. And if that image faces south or, 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 or uh, anywhere that sees the sun, when the sun comes through, it makes a very bright spot on the wall. And in my photography studio, I was a professional photographer for 40 years, I noticed the solar disk, the image of the sun one day, uh, on the wall. And I tracked it. I drew circles where it was for every minute. And one day it was here, the path was here, and the next day it moved over here. So I followed it for an entire year as it worked its way up and down my wall. And then I transferred that data to the interior of the tower. Basically, the camera obscura solar disk telegram is generally you have a, 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 southern, a southern hole in the wall, and then down on the floor is this a chart which uh, the sun of the solar disk, the image of the sun, will be like here at 10 o'clock and then 11, and at noon it crashes, and then it's 1, 2, 3. This is in the summer when the sun is really high in the sky. But when the, in the winter, when the sun is really low in the sky outside, I guess that's the south over there, if I got my bearings right, uh, then the sun is way up here uh, at, at 10 o'clock, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4. And on the equinox, it, it passes through the middle, September 21st and March 21st. So it's, the whole thing is a horologium, a building that keeps track of time. And what I found by studying the history of camera obscuras, that in the Renaissance, this was a huge thing. And what they did was they converted these giant cathedrals that had already been built. This is uh, 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 in Florence, uh, Santa Maria Novella. Uh, and they would put an aperture up at the top, and then a noon line, or, or a meridian line, or sometimes they call it a rose line, right up the middle. And some of these uh, churches still have these lines in them today. And by watching with the summer uh, sun, uh, the image of the sun crosses on the summer solstice, which would be here, on the equinox and on the winter solstice, and counting the number of days, they were able to prove to Pope Gregory the Thirteenth that the Julian calendar was out of sync from the sun by 10 days, leading to the Gregorian calendar reform of 1583. Uh, in other words, Julius Caesar had been in a calendar at 45 BC, and he said that, well, the year was about 365 and a quarter days long, well, he was exactly, he wasn't exactly right. So every 128 years, the calendar was out of sync from the sun. So by the time we get to the 1500s, they were off by 10 days. Now, it really doesn't matter, it's just the calendar. But what happened was that uh, it, uh, uh, by, by being off by 10 days, they told the Pope that, that they, didn't, they didn't really have to change it. He didn't want, but he would be celebrating Easter on the wrong Sunday. So they made the change. France, Italy, Germany, and Spain, they all made the change. Now here is uh, Santa Maria degli Angeli, which is in Rome. There's the aperture up there. I visited this church. The interior is up by Michelangelo. And this is a retrofit of putting the Meridiano line in it. And you'll see it's made of bronze. It's embedded right on the floor with marble on both sides. Each one of the days will uh, 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 let it light off. And they call it a heliometer, a, 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 a measure of time in the house of God, they call it. And by watching with the sun cross every day, they were able to prove this. Now in England, the Queen didn't know what to do. She'd been excommunicated by the Pope. In fact, everybody in England had been excommunicated by the Pope because, because the Queen didn't go along with, with, uh, with uh, all of the Catholic ritual. And, and, and they, she was starting the, the, the Church of England and, and the Bronx and things. So she needed advice. If I go to France or Italy, Germany, our people trade, they're going to be off by 10 days. They come back, they'll have to change the 10 days. Oh, it'd be a mess. So she needs advice. Who does she get to, to, to uh, give her advice on this? She asked her wisest philosopher, John D. <laughs> who we heard about a little bit earlier, whether she should change the calendar. And he writes a 60 page treatise at her request in the year 1582, a plain discourse on the reform of the calendar. And he says, yeah, you can tell by these camera obscurers we're off by 10 days. He says, uh, 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 he writes this thing called the circle of time, which I'm just showing part of here. But it starts with Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, the sons of Israel, uh, Breedon, <laughs> Copernicus, the very last thing. He says, Queen Elizabeth, the reformer of the year for the next Christian epoch. And that's to begin in the year 1583, which is the same year I claimed the Newport Tower was built. Because one day, I was in the library at the, at the, uh, at the, at the uh, Newport uh, uh, Historical Society, and uh, Bert Lippincott uh, went down to get a book. I said, do you mind if I just browse around? And he said, no, it's okay. And I pulled out this book on the shelves. It was called uh, Newport Begins by Lloyd Robson. And on it was this list. It says historical names for Narragansett Bay. Now, Marizano had been here in 1525. 1524, he wrote a report in 1525, 
and his brother called this place Bonifugio, and then Verrazano, his brother, uh, called it Bonifugio, Maggiolo, and then, uh, and then the Spanish called it the Bay of Santa Batista, and then there's others, the John D. Bay of River, 1583, and then the Dutch call it Nassau, and then and it wasn't until uh, 1634 that they called it Narianza Bay, and I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't know the Cougar was 1620. Why would this baby named after an Englishman? And the only guy who wrote about the, the camera obscura, and the guy who knew about the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the calendar trade. So what the hell happened in 1583 that was so big? Well, I found out that in 16, 1577, John D. wrote these eight books to Queen Elizabeth, telling her that Spain was becoming a superpower. They had all the gold and silver from Mexico, and, and they, were, they were taking over the New World. And if he didn't get a, didn't get a foothold in the New World, they were sunk. And so uh, first thing he said in this book, he says, she should uh, 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 raise Penny Navy, 60 to 80 large ships, and hire 6,000 seamen. Navy invented this compass that allowed you to navigate in the northernmost latitudes where the longitude lines converge. And in this uh, book right here, uh, he coins the term the British Empire. And in this book, he convinces her that she has a legal right to all of North America because earlier Englishmen like King Arthur and Prince uh, Maddox and John and Sebastian Cabot and, and St. Brendan had been to the New World and claimed it for England already. Now, whether you think those guys are fantasy or not, uh, King Arthur or some people don't believe in King Arthur, it doesn't matter what we think about King Arthur today. These guys believed in him. And, and so, uh, 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 based on all of this book, by the way, this is the front cover of this book, and it's called Hieroglyphicon Britannicon, a British hieroglyphic. And he writes plural Latin, palm patent, which in Latin means more is hidden than, than meets the eye. Here's the, uh, the queen, the eye of the ship of state to the new world, and the people are on their knees, uh, saying in Greek, es dolos es dos menos postes es which means, uh, send forth the sailing expedition to build the steadfast watch post. And here they come to the new, new world. This is all filled with, with clues. Up here you've got Yahweh, uh, the sun, God, sun, everything's aligned. Anyway, uh, John Dee also drew a map in 1580 in which he said, uh, then here's the place that you want to land. You want to go to this triangular island, which is uh, Block Island, uh, which uh, Verrazano had written about, this triangular island. And just north of it is a beautiful bay that uh, Verrazano said was good enough for an entire navy, a refuge for an entire navy, a refugio. And so uh, a month later, the queen deeds all of North America to this guy, Sir Humphrey Gilbert. And uh, he was a courtier in, a war, uh, in the war in Ireland, and he was uh, a major general. Here's his, uh, his slogan, quid non, with his little uh, with graphic here, which means, why not? This guy, this guy, the original guy with balls, okay? He would <laughs> attack, attack the, the Spanish, he would attack. And he said, he said to the Queen, he said, I got this program where we want to go out and just like annihilate the Spanish shipping and steal all of this. Anyways, uh, with John Dee's advice, uh, this guy gets deeded the entire continent of North America. Now, he, did, he was so appreciative of the work that Dee did, he gives Dee all the land that's known as the 50 degree line. That's all Alaska, Canada, and Greenland went to John Dee, and everything below, except of course for Florida, because that's where the Spanish were, uh, went to Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Well, in 1580, they sent out a preliminary expedition, a, a ship, by a guy by the name of Simon Fernandes, who was a very famous uh, pilot. He was actually uh, from uh, the Portuguese island of uh, Turchera in the Azores, but he became an English citizen, and this guy could navigate the world. He, he later, he later uh, helped uh, the English navigate all across uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Atlantic many times. Anyways, he took Sir Humphrey Gilbert's ship called the Squirrel. Uh, it was only an eight-ton ship, but only held ten men. And he made it across the Atlantic and back again in two months. And he scouted the area where this, uh, where this new settlement should be. And then in 1582, uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Dee and another guy, by the name of John Peckham, who was a financier, he was a Catholic uh, recusant, but uh, he was the one that helped fund it. They sent two ships and a pinnace, a small boat that we rode or sail under the leadership of Anthony Brigham to the New World. And this was the mission that I claimed built this tower to be the city center of the first Elizabethan colony in the New World. You see, John Dee wrote the deed for Sir Humphrey Gilbert, and he said, well, we're going to make Gilbert do something. He didn't just give him all of North America. He said, I know. We'll make him say, well, you have to say that he has to build a fort, and he has to occupy it for one year before he actually owns the whole thing. Well, that's why they sent this expedition a year earlier, to build this fort, so when Sir Humphrey got there the following year, it would be ready, and they'd start the talk on, on this, uh, this one-year thing. 1583, Sir Humphrey and five ships set sail with 280 men and five ships from Plymouth, England. 
<coughs> One day out, the bar brawl, they got a contagious disease. They had to head back home. Uh, they think it was a mutiny of some kind. The other four ships decided to, uh, to split up because they hit fog and they, they, they reconnoitered and met again in St. John's Harbor in, uh, in Newfoundland. And uh, he's very famous up there in Newfoundland. Here are the, uh, the, five, the four ships uh, arriving at St. John's Harbor. When they arrived there, there were 30 ships there. 12 were, were Spanish and, uh, 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 and, uh, and French, and 12 were, uh, excuse me, 15 were Spanish and French, and 15 were uh, English and Portuguese. The, the, uh, the, uh, the fishermen had been going there for centuries, for, for at least decades, let me put it that way, not centuries. Uh, because it was the best fishing harbor, you'd fish on the Georgia's banks, and they had their own little community there. Everybody got along over here. Even though it was Spain and England and everybody was fighting in Europe, these guys got along. Anyways, uh, Sir Humphrey stayed there for two weeks, and you'll see, I went up there, and right up there on the ground, it says in 1583, Sir Humphrey took possession of this newfound land for Queen Elizabeth, thereby founding Queen Elizabeth's overseas empire. He wasn't headed there. He just uh, stopped over there. But they claim that he founded the empire there. He was headed down to the D River. Well, he gets in his boat, and, and he heads down to the D River, and he hits a tempest. At first, the delight that his largest uh, uh, supply ship got, hit, got, uh, got crashed, and then uh, he was in the squirrel, the smallest ship, a huge wave came and swallowed him up, and he, we never saw him again. So they said, well, he never made it to uh, Narragansett Bay, Jim. He couldn't have built the tower. But I claim that there was that preliminary expedition, and they built it a year earlier, and then the, the whole thing had to be abandoned. Well, the deed to North America was in Sir Humphrey Gilbert's name. And so it became void. Even Dee's uh, property became void. But a year later, the Queen deeded all of North America to Sir Humphrey Gilbert's younger half-brother. And you guys know who he was. His name was Sir Walter Raleigh. 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 Sir Walter Raleigh made three expeditions to the Roanoke Islands, 1584, 1585, 1587. Those were unsuccessful as well. The Roanoke Colony, Virginia Dee, and all that stuff. But a few people know that this was Gilbert's brother, but everybody's heard of this guy, but nobody's ever heard of Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Why? He didn't make it past Maine. <laughs> Anything north of Maine, that's those guys up there. That's not our history. We're Americans. We're here. If you didn't make it to Maine, throw him. <laughs> anyway, very famous thing. Anyway, this guy, John Dee, was not only the architect of the entire plan uh, uh, to colonize the New World, I claim he was the architect of the tower. He was a very learned man, as we learned this morning. He knew about Kabbalah, he knew about numbers. He, he was the first man to translate uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, Euclid's uh, uh, propositions in, uh, in, in the first in the translation of Euclid's Elements. He had a library of 4,000 books. He was the navigational guy for all the great Elizabethan explorers. And his most cherished work of the 40 books that he wrote was called the Monas Hieroglyphica, Sacred Symbol of Oneness. Now you guys will notice here these two pillars here, Joachim and Boaz, whatever you want to call it. He calls it the sun column and the moon column, fire, air, earth, and water. And here's this egg shape here. You can notice this egg-shaped uh, rock in the tower. Uh, and, and then these little clues, Mercury, when made stable by a single point, and that was the parent and king of all the planets. And John Dee was Cancer the Crab. Here's two Mercuries, they're pointing to a little hole. And then Leo the Lion was Maximilian, the head of all of Northern Europe. Who Dee dedicates this work? Well, I translated this work from Latin and, 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 and deciphered this work, and inside uh, I found what I call a hidden blueprint for the tower. Well, John Dee says uh, he uses this figure that is called the, uh, the, uh, uh, the monad symbol, which has the moon on top, he says, and then this is the sun, and this is the cross of the elements, fire, air, earth, and water, and this is the symbol for Aries down at the bottom. And he says it's very important. If A, B is 1, and this is 2, this is 2, this is 3, you have to stay exactly in these proportions. For ornament, you can extend it a little bit. But, uh, and then at the end of this book, he has a chart, which uh, no one's really been able to decipher for the last 450 years. And, and, and he breaks the life into two different sections. He says, thus the world was made. It's his entire cosmology in one chart. And on the top part, he has a super celestial area. And on the bottom part, it's the terrestrial area. But up here, he's only got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And down below, he's got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, fire, air, earth, and water. 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, black, clear, yellow, red, 24, 25, to 11, 12, and 13. No one's been able to decipher this work for the last 150 years, except for one person. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> I read all of the books, 
And I figured out, but he leaves one clue. He says at the very end that, that, that all numbers boil down to these limitiglus statistiae, that there are fixed limits within numbers. And he boils it all down to this one number down at the bottom. He calls it the magistralia. Here he has virtue, pondera, which means weight and time. But the master number, limitification fermentation, is the philosopher's stone of number is 252. He says, if you can figure that out, you'll figure out the whole thing. Well, I figured out 252, and I figured out what, uh, what he meant by the entire book. And, and, and I had a tool to figure out 252 that people didn't have in the 1800s and 1900s when they first started deciphering John Dee's work. Uh, you know what tool I used to figure out 252? I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Googled 252. Guess who shows up? This guy here, Buckminster Fuller, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century. Buckminster Fuller invented the geodesic dome. It's all made out of triangles and a giant circle down at Epcot Center, that giant thing. Well, he was a geometer. At the end of his life, he said, I'm going to write these two books that explain everything I've learned in life. And in it, he talks about what's called closest packing of spheres. If you have one sphere, exactly 12 spheres fit around it, and then 42, and then 92, and then 162, and the fifth layer closest packing of spheres has 252 spheres in it. And he says it all falls fine in, in, in number. If you take the number 12, which is a very important number in, in you know, Christian uh, heritage, in, in, in time, and everything, and you take the opposite of it, which is 21. Well, if you multiply 12 times 21, you get 252. 252, 2520 is the lowest number divisible by all the single digits, one to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Anyways, long story short, I'm not going to explain it because we don't have time today, but I, the tower, what you see, looks like this today. In the Revolutionary War, the British occupied Newport and they blew the top off the tower because they had stored their gunpowder and they didn't want the Americans to get it. But this is what I claim it originally looked like, that it had wood and then on this entablature of those shells that stick out and then another entablature at the top. And this was all made of stone, only comes to here now. And then this would all be wooded at, wood added on, but the whole thing, I think, was highly decorative. Back in the Renaissance, they had a technique called strafito, where they plastered something over and then full painted it to make it look like marble or brick or stone. And on the dome, on the south side, would be a hole right about here, and on the floor of the dome room, which is the dome room right here, would be the camera obscura soul of this calendar room. They keep track of time for 1583, which is what he was of main interest in. Here's my cutaway version. There's the dome room floor. We know that there were stairs that led from the fireplace up to the second floor. And I claim that there was another stairway that went to the three or three different rooms, and the whole thing has geometric proportions. It was built on what I call the two-circle design, which is a union of opposites, the two large circles. And each 24 it makes it 48 feet high, two to one proportion. And the whole thing was based upon the Monad symbol, the whole shape of the Monad symbol. You can put it on the same size circle down here. So these proportions, proportiones, were something that was very interesting in perspective of the art of uh, art. Was something that, so I've written these uh, eight books about it, and since then I've written eight uh, more books about it. Uh, that I have some of them for upstairs, uh, sale, for sale upstairs at my booth. You can see more at NewportTowerMuseum.com. And uh, what I just wanted to say at the end was that I'm finding now that in the 1800s, that there were people, uh, uh, scholars and architects, who were interested in the tower, and they, they uh, sort of made commentaries on it uh, on their own. Now, uh, you, you'll hear today that other people will talk about other theories of the tower. And, and because John D. came and made this tower, uh, and, 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 and Rhode Island was where freedom of religion started, I claim that this tower represents freedom of religion. So I have to let everybody have their own ideas about who built the tower. And so that's why I allow for all of these things. But <laughs> They're perfectly, you know, within right. In fact, I used to think it was built by the Templars. I went to Rome, I went to Jerusalem, I went to Casa del Monte in Barry, this beautiful eight-sided thing, and, and, and studied the Templars. And I just found out that they were so busy over there, they had, they had a lot to do. However, uh, what I'm talking about is this uh, tradition that, uh, that they, the, the first speaker spoke of, Greg spoke of today, that goes all the way back to like the Egyptians and, and, and the Greeks and the Romans, and then went to the Neoplatonists. These guys lived a couple of uh, centuries after uh, after uh, uh, after Christ, and then and then you get to the end. Uh, this tradition went on to the Arabs. They they carried it through, and then uh, they brought it to Spain, and they brought it to Cordoba. This whole Kabbalah thing, and in England. Uh, the guy who absorbed most of this information was this guy John Dee, because he had studied on the continent with all of these people. And then following John Dee, you got the Rosicrucians, and, and I believe that some of the things that you guys study in masonry today are actually 
part of this whole tradition. You guys are part of this whole tradition. So, uh, that's why I think it's very important that we learn about these things. If you know any architects or, or archaeologists or historians or yourself, if you're interested in the tower, come on down to Newport, the Newport Tower Museum. And if you think we dazzled you today, you should see the museum. Thank you very much.